Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in which we are discussing the glycine receptor and its involvement in hyperecplexia. Okay, so we're going to look at a mutation that occurs specifically in uh, the beta subunit of the glycine receptor, which can then lead to hyperecplexia. So, one of the mutations that has been uh, found to cause hyperplexia, and don't worry, I will tell you what hyperplexia is. I'm going to, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to show you the mutation, show you what it does to the glycine receptor, and then show you how that builds up to the symptoms of hyperplexia. So we'll get to the symptoms of hyperplexia. So, uh, the mutation that has been found to cause hyperplexia, or well, one of the mutations, there are, and I want to stress, there are many, many mutations in the beta subunit of 5-HT receptors which can cause hyperplexia. Uh, but one of them is this P250T mutation. Now, what does this mean? This means that if you take the beta subunit of glycine receptors, and we've seen in the previous video that the main type of glycine receptor that is found um, postsynaptically is this alpha-1 beta heteropentamer, where you have some alpha-1 subunits and some beta subunits. So basically, the beta subunit is pretty essential for glycinergic transmission. Okay, so if you take the beta subunit here, and we're looking at the beta subunit completely unfolded at the moment. So we're just looking at the um, polypeptide that is unfolded, okay? Right, so you can start counting the amino acids from the amino side here. So here's the amino terminus of this polypeptide, and then you can count the amino acids. So here's one, two, three, four, and you can continue on all the way to 250, and this 250th amino acid is usually a proline. So you now need to know the single letter amino acid code. Um, and P stands for proline, basically. So what this tells us is that the proline at position 250 has mutated to another amino acid, which we'll discuss in a moment. Now, let me discuss the structure of proline uh, with you. So proline is an interestingly structured amino acid. It's got a loop in it. So it's not got the conventional structure because the amino group is not just in its native form. So it's not uh, got two hydrogens bound to it. Instead, it's got something else linked here, which I'll show you in a moment. So you've got a hydrogen off the alpha carbon, and here's the carboxylic acid group here. But then you've got this loop as it is, a, a ring between this carbon and this nitrogen. So you've got a five-membered ring, like so, okay? And you'll have two hydrogens coming off each of these carbons. So you've got a cycle within the structure of proline, basically. Okay, so this is the amino acid proline, single letter amino acid code P. Right, so there was a proline at position 250, but it's now undergone mutation and it's mutated to T. So what does uh, the single letter amino acid code T stand for? Well, T, the single letter T, stands for the amino acid threonine, and you will see how different the amino acid threonine is from the amino acid proline. So let's now look at the amino acid threonine. So, amino acid threonine has got a more conventional amino acid structure. Here's the amino group, Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. Here's the carboxylic acid group down here. Okay. And then you've got a carbon off here with an alcohol group coming off it. And then a methyl group also coming off this carbon and a hydrogen. Okay, so this is the structure of the amino acid threonine. It's very, very different from the amino acid proline. So, you have changed the proline at position 250 to a threonine. Now, what that is going to cause is it's going to cause dysfunction in the uh, glycine receptor. Specifically, it hugely prolongs the time that it takes for a um, glycine receptor to come out of the desensitized state. Okay, so if we discuss the um, opening kinetics again. So we discussed that, basically, the glycine receptor starts off in this closed resting state, and then when the ligand binds, it goes into the open state, okay? Then, after a certain amount of time, it goes into the closed desensitized state. 
what will happen is then the neurotransmitter will be removed from the synaptic cleft. So by now, the uh, neurotransmitter is gradually being removed from the synaptic cleft because, of course, when you release a neurotransmitter, you don't just leave it in the synaptic cleft forever. You either break it down or you reuptake it. It's removed, basically, from the synaptic cleft. So the neurotransmitter will be now being removed from the uh, synaptic cleft, and the ligand molecule will fall off, basically, okay? Then what needs to happen is this closed desensitized state needs to go back to the closed resting state, and usually it goes through the open state. So usually what happens is it goes back to the open state transiently, and then instantly, pretty much instantly, it will go back to the closed resting state. Uh, this is because this structure is very different from this structure, and usually what has to happen is to get to this structure, you have to have gone to there, and then something else has to happen to turn it into there, and basically you undo this thing that happens to take it from there to there, to take it back to here, and then you undo the change that took you from here to here to take you back to here. So usually you do have to go back into the open state very, very transiently, and then you'll just turn back into the closed resting state. Now. Um, in, um, the, um, in this mutant beta receptor subunit, glycine receptors, so we've discussed that the most common form of glycine receptors are these alpha-1 beta heteropentamers, which have both alpha-1 and beta subunits in. So if you've got a glycine receptor which has this mutant beta receptor in it, okay, this P250T mutant beta receptor subunit in it, and then what happens is that beta receptor subunit uh, stops the glycine receptor going from the closed desensitized state to the open state. Well, it doesn't stop it, but it makes this process extremely slow. Okay, so let me now describe for you what will happen. So it will start in the closed resting state. Some glycine will come along. It will go into the open state. It will then go into the closed desensitized state. The neurotransmitter will be removed from the synaptic cleft, so the glycine has now gone, and the, um, the glycine receptor should now return to the closed resting state via this pathway. But now it's just going to remain in the closed desensitized state for ages and ages and ages and ages and ages. Now, if the inhibitory interneuron then fires another burst of glycine, what will happen? Well, all of the receptors are going to be in this closed, desensitized state. So, yes, maybe the ligand will bind, but it's not going to do anything because it's just in the closed, desensitized state. It hasn't actually gone back to this form. So, even if the ligand binds, it will just remain in the closed, desensitized state. It won't open. So, you won't get any chloride anions coming in. You won't get any inhibitory postsynaptic poten uh, current. Okay? So... What's going to happen is the amount of inhibitory postsynaptic current that your alpha motor neuron is going to receive is going to go down, okay? And we know what that causes. If the inhibitory postsynaptic current goes down, then these excitatory neurons will now no longer be neutralized, basically. Their excitatory postsynaptic currents, their EPSCs, won't be neutralized by the inhibitory postsynaptic current, and it will cause the alpha motor neuron to fire too much, okay? Right, uh, so you'll get too much contraction of the uh, skeletal muscle cells. And this is why hyperplexia is also known as stiff baby syndrome because it causes muscle stiffness in the babies. Um, so babies born with this hyperplexia, uh, they have, they're very, very stiff because their muscles are just continuously contracting, basically. In addition, in addition to the stiffness, they also have amplified startle responses. So their startle responses are massive. Now, what do I mean by a startle response? Well, let me give you an example of something that recently happened to me. So, I was walking to a door, and I was just about to push the door open, and then the door flies open, and someone else has pulled it from the other side. And I was right at the door, so I sort of jumped back, 
and the, my response, my startle response is actually quite big. Uh, I throw my hands in front of my face, sort of. I don't quite get my hands to my face, but they sort of move towards my face to shield me from the horrors that I have just found. Um, so basically that's the startle response, that you jump back and your uh, hands usually move over your face, basically. So in these babies with the uh, hyperplexia, the startle response is very, very high. So if you poke them, they will uh, undergo a startle response. Uh, and their startle responses are very amplified, and usually they're followed by uh, very much uh, a stiffness period, where their muscles are all very, very tense and very difficult to move. Okay, uh, so why does the starter response go up? Well, when you think about it, what has to happen in the starter response is you contract a huge number of muscles. Okay, now if the alpha motor neurons are already over-firing, then this is going to cause the skeletal muscle cells to be amplified even more, basically. So when you stimulate these alpha motor neurons, okay, which innovate the skeletal muscle cell, to contract. So let's say this is a skeletal muscle cell that is going to, let's say, in the bicep. So it's going to flex the arm to try and move my hand over my face. Okay. Now, all of these alpha motor neurons have got much less inhibition on them. So when the, um, when the neurons from the brain, the pyramidal neurons, come down to stimulate this um, alpha motor neuron, they're going to provide the same level of stimulation as they would have when the inhibitory motor inhibitory engine neurons were working properly. But now, when these inhibitory engine neurons aren't working properly because of the P250T mutation, those uh, neurons from the brain are going to overstimulate the alpha motor neurons. They're going to leave to uh, far too many alpha motor neurons that innovate this muscle cell being activated. And I want to stress that each muscle cell, each skeletal muscle cell, is a giant of a cell. It does not just have one axon in, uh, innovating it. It has a whole bunch of motor neurons sitting in here, which all innovate this single skeletal muscle cell. And this is known as the motor neuron pool for that skeletal muscle cell. Okay, so this is the motor neuron pool. And each skeletal muscle cell will have a motor neuron pool. So basically, what you're going to do is you're going to activate far too many of these um, alpha motor neurons in the motor neuron pool for each skeletal muscle cell. And you're going to do this for absolutely all of the skeletal muscle cells, maybe in the biceps muscle. So you're going to get complete overactivation of biceps, and that's what causes these amplified startle responses. Okay, so what's nice about this disease is that if the baby survives to three years, three years of age, then generally it sorts itself out. So it's not an adult illness, and that's not because they all die. Instead, it sorts itself out after three years. So sorts itself out. So something happens, and this isn't understood, itself out um, after three years. Something changes. The body adapts, basically. It realises, the body realises that there is a problem here, that the alpha motor neurons aren't receiving enough inhibition, and something changes that means that uh, this lack of glycinergic transmission uh, is no longer a problem, and we don't know what that is. Okay, but for some reason, after three years of age, this is not a problem anymore. Okay, the problem... The bad news, that's the good news, the bad news is that 25% of people born with hyperplexia don't make it to their third birthday. And the reason that they don't make it to their third birthday is the diaphragm. The diaphragm needs to contract rhythmically in order for us to breathe. It needs to contract and relax. If you get hyperexcitation of the diaphragm, then it's just going to remain contracted and contracted and it won't relax. And if you don't relax the diaphragm, then uh, you, don't, um, you don't go through the proper respiratory cycle, basically. Okay? Uh, so you don't breathe. Right. Uh, so, um, basically, these babies often die of apnea. Okay? So this is a nice word. Revising our respiratory physiology. Apnea, and it has two spellings, confusingly. This really horrible spelling, apnoia, 
apnea, and then the more common sense spelling, which is apnea. So your old boy physiologist will use this one, and they insist that you use this one. Um, most modern, reasonable people will be fine with you using this one. Okay, so apnea means that you stop breathing. This is a temporary um, cessation of breathing. Temporary cessation of breathing. So basically what happens is generally the babies will be put to sleep. Uh, sorry, not put to sleep. That's awful. Uh, they'll, they'll go to bed and then they'll stop breathing at some point when they're asleep. And, um, um, and then if they stop breathing for long enough, then they're going to die. Okay, so... Apnea then leads to asphyxiation, basically. So asphyxiation is another good word. Asphyxiation. Asphyxiation means dying because um, you aren't breathing, basically. It means dying because you aren't getting enough oxygen to your brain, to your heart, to your liver, to your organs, to your body. Uh, and it's because your lungs just aren't working. Your respiratory system is just not bringing the oxygen into the lungs uh, so that it can go around the body. Okay, so these children often die of asphyxiation due to uh, apnea, which results as uh, because of the stiffness that the uh, hyperapexia causes. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.